Okay. Okay. I'm here. Okay, I'm here. Okay. All right. I heard you. All right. That's good to see you again. <clears throat> All right. Hi, Elkan. David, how are you? Very good, thank you. Any more? Okay. In just a few minutes. Okay. All right. Got it, okay. The right okay. channel. Okay. Elkin, hi. Yes. Hi. Yeah, do you recognize me? A little bit. Yeah, it's me. For you, okay. I have a new name. It's iPhone. iPhone. That's me. No, it looks, no, Julia. It looks like it looks like. No, your How hair's you done differently. Say what? Your hair looks different now. Cause different style, I think. Yeah, it's called looking like a porcupine. If I don't get, you get a haircut, you look nice. No, I haven't got a haircut. I'm not a haircut. I got we had a haircut with March twelfth. The day before uh, everything stopped in New Jersey. March said, 12th. Well, yeah, that's so the day before. So yeah. have, I'm going to, and they're open at some, probably, I'm going to try to go Thursday or Friday. Cool. This, it's a long time yeah. to go. Yeah. Well, it's better than getting sick, right? It is better than getting is, sick. Is Rabbi Annie on here yet? I want to ask her something. Not yet. Oh, okay. I don't see yet, but. <laughs> Elkin, do you know, yeah. Elkin, which things, I, I keep forgetting to erase stuff from my calendar when I add something new. So right. I have her giving a lecture every hour on the hour, every Wednesday. Do you have, no, well, what? It's Wednesday night. No, I just, David, I just got an email from David. It's going, this will be the last week. She's taking a break after this week. So what, what's the last week, hon? Of the, of the study sessions for a while. Today and Wednesday, right? Will be the yes. last. Session. Yeah, she she made a decision to um, take a little bit of a break. It's getting to be a little bit too much for her. Okay, so the Mondays we're done with. We're on sabbatical. And Wednesday, what are we having? Are we still having Psalms? So uh, Psalms, Psalms were supposed to end in two weeks. Right. Um, but um, she's going to end it this week after three sessions. Okay. And what about this uh, mindfulness uh, minion at nine o'clock at night? That's still, that's at eight thirty on Wednesdays and seven forty-five a.m. on Fridays. That will continue yes. through the summer. Um, well, what, here. now's Randy's, the time to ask. Rav Annie's there. Okay. <laughs> Question for Rav Annie. Again. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Julie hi. has a Julie has two questions for you. Yeah. Days. Sure. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I I failed to delete stuff when I added today, and I'm trying to clarify which things you're doing, uh, so I can fix up my calendar. Because as it is, I have you listed like to do something every four hours, so I want to cut down on that. <laughs> you mean in terms of study opportunities that we've been? Yeah. Doing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
right now this is our this week is kind of our last uh for for i'm taking july to kind of focus on some other stuff and high holidays and our shabbats you know mornings so this is our last lunch and learn um for the summer we're taking a hiatus and then also the psalms class we have a final session this wednesday we're going to look at the 23rd psalm oh. so i hope it will be uh a juicy class is my favorite psalm. Anyway, um, so that yeah. So, but these classes are concluding this week, um, and then I will, you know, um, pick up some more teaching. God willing, come you know Elul and um, okay, and into the fall. So, and what other classes? Let's see. The minions. What what days are the minions that you're doing? Oh, the mind. The mind sure. That will continue. That's um, Wednesday night at eight thirty, and. Friday morning, 7.45, we do the Mindful Minions. Fine. Um, okay. <clears throat> how is everybody um, holding up this, okay. this week? I'm here. You're here, yeah. I still have the sessions this morning. I know, no, right. I've been good to see, right? Um, and I see, so yeah, who's on eight three one? Who's joining us on that number? Is someone joining us on the phone? Hello. Uh, they're unmuted. Whoever it is is unmuted. No, it's still muted. They're still muted. muted. Okay, well, we're happy you're here. I'm happy everybody's here. Um, and we have. Um, a double uh, parsha this Shabbos, Chukat, Balak. Um, but one of the things that we've been doing in some of our lunch and learn sessions, right, we've been focused on this idea of parsha nut. And so, for a few of these summer sessions, we've been playing around a little bit together on the the website um, Safaria, where you have access um, and link to so many different um uh, commentators and common commentaries um so we are gonna um jump today hukat is um a fascinating parsha and you know one of the the things that um happens in parshat hukat is we get instructions for what to do um, when someone has sort of encountered death and how to become purified from the process, right? There's this, this uh, ritual law of the para aduma. Um, and so we read this section, right? Even in between Purim and, and Pesach, we have a number of special parshiot and we um, read parashat para and um, during that time when you know, it's, it's function, I think, there ritually is that people had to purify or, you know, kind of go through a process getting ready for Pesach to, to, be, to bring the Pesach offering. And this understanding that when one has kind of come in contact with death, you develop like a spiritual condition called Tuma, where you're, you're cut off in certain ways ritually um, from the sacred, sacred space. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about it and how we read this Parsha and how we understand this Parsha um, in a time that we're living in of a global pandemic, you know, which has taken more lives in our country than um, many wars <laughs> um, combined. And what, what does that look like? You know, what, what does that feel like spiritually? Um, and also in a time when we think about this, these categories of Tuma and Tahara and Tuma would mean like you'd be prevented from bringing, so if you've somehow been exposed or come in contact with death, you'd be forbidden from entering the sacred space to make offerings until you went through some kind of purification um, process. And I struggle to use the word purification because I think it has other connotations in, in English than, than Tuma and Tahara, right, do in Hebrew. Um, but it's kind of like a spiritual condition of like, being cut off from others. Um, and I feel like we're in a, in a time when there is sort of so much cutting off from others and attempts at reconnecting. But I don't know, that, that analogy of the Tuma 
um, at the moment feels feels uh, resonant. And anyway, so I wanted for us to look together at um, you know the beginning of Parashat Chukat, which describes the law of the Para Aduma, which is also known for being incredibly enigmatic among rituals, like. That, that we have. So I thought we'll, we'll read it together and we'll take a peek at our, our friend at the commentator Rashi <laughs> and see if he can help us, you know, uh, illuminate what's happening and also, you know, what kind of resonances we, we see, um, you know, for, for ourselves for this, this moment that, that we're living in. So I'm going to put the um, Safaria up on the screen and we're going to read through in the English kind of We'll see if we can read through this section, um, a number of verse, you know, the chapter, chapter 19, um, as a section, and then we'll go back and unpack it, um, you know, in some more depth with, with commentaries. So give me one second. I will share my screen with all of you. Um, okay. Would somebody um, like to read the English for us here in chapter... <laughs> Um, 19? Huh? Beth, is that a hand? Or, or is it, you're muting right. Yeah. I'll read. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, this is the ritual law that the Lord has commanded. Instruct the Israelite people to bring you a red cow without blemish. Whoops. Okay. in yeah. which there is no defect and on which no yoke has been laid. You shall give it to Eleazar the priest. He shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. Beautiful. Shall I go on? Um, yep, keep going, and then we'll come, come back. The cow shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, flesh, and blood shall be burned, its dung included. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson stuff, and throw them into the fire, consuming the cow. The priest shall wash his garments and bathe his body in water. After that, the priest may re-enter the camp, but he shall be unclean until evening. He who performed the burning shall also wash his garments in water, bathe his body in water, and be unclean until evening. A man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the cow and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place to be kept for water of lustration for the Israelite community. It is for cleansing. Okay. We'll keep going. He who gathers up the ashes of the uh, he who gathers up the ashes of the cow shall also wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. This shall be a permanent law for the Israelites and for the strangers who reside among you. He who touches the corpse of any human being shall be unclean for seven days. He shall cleanse himself with it on the third day and on the seventh day, and then be clean. If he fails to cleanse himself on the third and seventh days, he shall not be clean. Whoever, whoever touches a corpse, the body of a person who has died, and does not cleanse himself, defiles the Lord's tabernacle. That person shall be cut off from Israel. Since the water of lustration was not dashed on him, he remains unclean. His uncleanness is still upon him. Okay, we'll keep going a little more. <laughs> this is the ritual. When a person dies in a tent, whoever enters the tent and whoever is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel with no lid fastened down shall be unclean. And I just want to, sorry, I'm going to just pause for one second because of translation. It's saying clean and unclean, but again, it's the, the Hebrew of unclean is tameh. And I feel like the translation of unclean, I don't think totally resonates, right? So, so I'm going to just think of it as tameh, as this 
condition of spiritual um, cut offedness. Okay, so yeah. Um, all right, <laughs> keep going, does, Slomo. Thank does, you. Does, yeah. cut, does cut off here mean just put out of the camp, cut off by being put out of the camp, or does it mean cut off, killed? Oh no. So yeah, not not killed. Um, when I say cut off in reference to this word tame, um, it means more like not able to go into sacred space, right? I'm asking. I'm asking the use of it in the text where it says that person shall be cut off from the rest of the people. That oh means yeah. So earlier side. on, where that we means, said that means put out of the camp, or that means oh, shall cut be... off from Israel, right? So that's v'nichrita hanefesh. Yeah, it's correct. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not killed. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, there's so many questions. This is very confusing, but I want us just to like get the flow and then we're going to go back and, and unpack. So, um, Shlomo, where, let's see, you were on chapter, on verse 16, right? I don't see any numbers, but. Oh, here, this tiny little number in the second. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Okay. Top you, want, yeah. you want me to continue with 16? Yeah, we'll just keep going. We're almost and, done. And in the open, anyone who touches a person who was killed or who died naturally <sighs> or human bone or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Some of the ashes from the fire of cleansing shall be taken for the unclean person and fresh water shall be added to them in a vessel. A person who is clean shall take hyssop, dip it in the water and sprinkle it and sprinkle on the tent and on all the vessels and people who were there, or on him who touched the bones or the person who was killed or died naturally or the grave. The clean person shall sprinkle it upon the unclean person on the third day and on the seventh day, <coughs> thus cleansing him by the seventh day. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe in water, and at night nightfall he shall Mm. Clean. Okay. If anyone who has become unclean fa fails to cleanse himself, that person shall be cut off from the congregation, for he has defiled the Lord's sanctuary. The water of lustration was not dashed on him. He is unclean. <coughs> that shall be for them a law for all time. Further, he who sprinkled the water of lustration shall wash his clothes, and whoever touches the water of lustration shall be unclean until evening. Whatever that unclean person touches shall be unclean, and the person who touches him shall be unclean until evening. Okay, so that is the whole um, chapter 19. I just wanted us to, to read through the, the red piece heifer. as a whole, right, of the red heifer, the para duma. Um, Sorry, I'm just scrolling a little. So let me just, you know what, let me stop the share for a second and then I'll um, bring it back um, in just a moment. I want to come back to the top. So yeah, so what what uh, questions does that narrative raise raise for you? Um, you can either, if you want to say them or, or put them in the chat. So here, right, thank you, Shlomo just read for us um, this ritual, right, the, the Israelite people, should bring a, red, a paraduma, a red cow without blemish, um, no defect, who's never worked, bring it to the priest. This red heifer is going to be taken out of the camp and slaughtered, right? So that's the first we get, yeah. the red heifer. And Elazar, the priest, is going to sprinkle some of the blood towards the, you know, in the front of the tent of meeting. Then the cow is going to be burned in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Um and all the other materials, some cedar wood and other things are going to be thrown in there. Then the priest has to bathe. Um, the priest is going to re-enter the camp, but the priest will have contracted this tuma somehow. Then this other person who is Tahor, right, um, or clean, whatever that means, right, is going to gather up the ashes of the cow, deposit them outside the camp, um, and to be make these special waters of purification um and the person who touches the ashes of the cow is also going to then contract this tuma um and then we're told you know anybody who comes in contact with a corpse um has to be will be in the state of tuma for seven days 
And then we have the special water made from the mixture of the para aduma, the red heifer. Um, and there's a process by which that person, right, is cut off, but the person can come back in by, um, by being kind of immersed in these waters. Um, and um, that person, you know, can do a ritual and also sprinkle the waters on the tent and on everything else. Um, and on this person who had come in contact with death and was, was Tame. Um, right. So, um, and the, anyone who's involved in the ritual at all also has to go through another, another process. So this is, yeah, a very complicated and enigmatic ritual. What are your um, questions that, that come up in, in reading this uh, chapter? From the parsha. Yeah. One of, I, my question is, I mean, yeah, uh, if you put it in contemporary terms, do funeral directors have to stay on through continually because you know, or doctors too? I mean, technically, are they supposed to handle? I mean, they keep um, through permanently because they're basically dealing with death seven days a week, or six days a week. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, when do we stop this practice? And the, the other idea was that if uh, one person touches the unclean person, right? Because there was somebody who was not coming in direct contact with the deceased or the grave, but somehow the contact with, with a unclean person, I mean, how, how does he, I mean, I guess he knows it, but is he just even touching the finger, is that, uh, you know, is that enough? To make him un the other person unclean, and he has to stay unclean till the evening too. Does he has to bathe himself and say, I forgot what it said here already, but does he have to stay unclean till the evening, or does he have to go bathe himself? And right. so, if someone touches, and the question was then, yeah. if someone touches him, uh -huh. the second person, is he also in, in violation? Then? We have to go, uh -huh. that's not specified in the set in the, in the reading, right? So, if the so. person who is helping to purify, right? Right, but, and he becomes, you know, unclean, and another person touches him, mm -hmm. is the, the third person, is that person also considered unclean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, how, you know? Right, at what, at what point? Yeah. Does it, it does right. Does it stop somewhere? Does it stop somewhere, yeah. right. And, and also, no, I think that's a helpful question, and also noting that, right, that it does, yeah. You know that it's not contained with just like the experience right. of one person who comes right. in contact with death. In order for the person to be come back into community, yeah. you know, other people are involved and are then um, uh, touched in the process. Beth, right. Beth wrote something. Yeah, brilliant in the chat box. Um, okay. Contact tracing, right? Contact. Well, that's in essence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, pretty, uh... Slow mo. Your hand is raised. Yes. Yeah. I, I think further adding to the complication of this concept of tuma. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure impurity is the right word, or I'm not sure we have a word right. because because people who touch what is being used to make other people clean become impure, if that's the word. Yeah. Tuma, may right. by right. touching the stuff that makes other people tahar. Uh huh. So right. so it's not impurity it's not uncleanliness it's not bacterial i mean right. i don't know what it is in english but just touching the cleaning stuff makes you impure impure is very difficult to understand what this concept of tuma is mm -hmm. that the stuff that's meant to give the tahara right make somebody tahor if you touch it you become tame right uh -huh. it's, uh -huh. it's paradoxical right Right. Um, and the other, oh, the other quick question was, if, you know, and they said that, um, from what I read reading, that there were strangers in the, in the midst, or midst, with the, the gar, the garim, yeah. right, the strangers. Now, if you touch their bodies, does this same rule apply, or because they're not really Jewish, there's a different rule that applies? All right, I mean... I don't, remember, I don't think they specify, if I remember right, I don't think they specify that in the readings. I'm trying to remember if that's in the reading. Meaning the question of who? If you, if, if in, a Jew, in, uh -huh. in, in, with B'nai Israel, 
would come in contact with a gare mm -hmm. who was in our, in our midst, and he, and he dies, and you touch his body, you know, to bury him or whatever, the, the same rules apply, uh, or is it, or so is it I, different? Right. Um, I think it does have to do with any... Uh, any, any body? Not, right. Tumata mate. Yeah. Like a state of ritual. And okay. Goodness, um, and right comes by either if you have direct or indirect contact with uh, uh, a mate, a body of, of one who's died, and and mm. it, do, it, do, it doesn't matter kind of status, like if the person is you know, of the community or, or not. Yeah, okay. um, yeah no, but good question. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. So. Um, all the background. What's that? I asked, what's all the background noise? The background? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I had, there was a car alarm going off on my street, so that's why I turned off my okay, sound before, but right now I think we've, um, so the, um, what do you think also of like, this part is interesting to me too, why does the cow have no blemish, right, or, or has never worked? Well, Well, I think in all the rituals, I know they went without blemish. Uh -huh. A lot of sacrifices, I remember reading that the cow or the whatever animal was must be without blemish. Uh huh. Okay. But as far as the part of working, I don't know. I mean, there weren't too many red heifers running around the, uh, around the wilderness, right? Uh, you know, what I remember, right? There weren't too many red heifers. Right. Yeah, it's not a big, uh, big commodity. Right. Uh, and no, and that and that's a, a piece of it. Also, is that um, it was apparently very rare. People question if there was even an actual, like, yeah. if it were possible to find because the Mishnah tells us, right, um, right. Mishnah Para, if it had two black hairs, it, it wouldn't be considered the Para Aduma, the right. red heifer, right? So, yeah, um, was it even possible? Which for me, I think spiritually kind of raises the question, you know, as like sort of what Shlomo was saying, it kind of and and. Um, I mean, Beth raised this idea of contact tracing, but like nobody's untouched in a certain way, right? If yeah. you start to like the ripples, I think because we're all um, mortal <laughs> and, you know, a as human beings at some point, you know, there are people who are obviously closer to death or closer to a loss and different levels of connection. But if you kind of get down to it, like as human beings, we're all susceptible, right? We're all right. Uh, here with a limited um, warranty, or I don't know what the, what the word is. Um, so, yeah. Um, Shlomo, yeah. This, this, this has just come to me, and it's, it's kind of, it's a word game I'm going to play here. Sure. And I'm going to try to answer your question as to why, if the cow has been, have, has been yoked, it's not acceptable. Uh -huh. And that's because the Hebrew, what the cow would be doing if it were yoked would be avodah, would be work. And avodah means two things. It means work, and it also means the worship of God. And we don't want to be using any cows that have been involved in any, uh, any other avodah except avodah, except that, of course, has nothing to do with the answer to your question. Hmm. Well... Yeah, well, yeah. That's interesting. That's, that's kind of <laughs> uh -huh. um. But there was something about the animals that were to be used for sacrifice were supposed to be young animals, first mm -hmm. first year or something like that. I don't remember that exactly. And maybe that was those younger animals never worked weren't worked yet anyhow. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, according, I, I think something that's interesting. <laughs> too is right if you if going to the mishnah like the requirements were pretty strict for what could actually be a you know usable paraduma and according to the mishnah um there were only nine so in the period of time between moshe and the Khorban, the this destruction of the second temple there were only nine red heifers that were actually slaughtered or found right it was so um rare in a way right and kind of um, and, and so it, like, I think it kind of, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting, the way the rabbis understand this law, and if we were to look at the Rashi too, is like, people are sort of like, this law makes no sense, right? And in a way, it's given, 
as so it's called um in in biblical law right there are hakim which are laws that apparently you can't find a rationale for they don't make sense and so this one by the rabbis is often given as like the prime example of a law that there's not um rationale for why um for why it exists in a way because it is so um complicated and hard to find and i think also like you know when i think about what it's used for um and, and looking for some meaning in that right the sense that there is no logic behind it um when we think about as human beings we strive to control so much and um and the thing that we ultimately like again can't control is that our time here is limited in that we're we're mortal that death is sort of like we hit the limits of what um reminds us how how limited you know we are and what we can control and what we can understand and that death you know um and god you know are kind of like beyond uh, our ability to to understand or or control um um yeah, so I do, let's see, I'm wondering if we can peek a little bit, Ooh. sorry, that was background noise in my house, okay, I, th I don't hear anybody crying, so I think it's <laughs> we have supervision, I'm just, okay, um, uh, so we can take a peek, um, you know, at some of the Rashi's, and let me pull this, pull this up, um, Okay, one second. Ah. Um, so Rashi, you know, I think comments again on, on Chukat, um, and Chukat is right, the name of ritual law, Chuk, Chukat. Um, so our Parshiot are named for um, the first unique word that comes up, right, in the Parsha that isn't in any other Parsha, right? So many start with, like, Vayedaber, like this one starts, right? Vayedaber, Moshe, El Moshe, Viel Aharon, Lemor, Zot, Chukat. So Chukat is, like, the first word that pops that we haven't seen, you know, yet as, as the name of another Parsha and the beginning of a Parsha, so that's where it gets its name. Um, yeah, interesting uh, tidbit. Um, but Rashi says, you know, this is an interesting midrash that Rashi cites. He says, because Satan and the nations of the world would taunt Israel, saying, what is this command and what reason is there for it? On this account, um, the Torah uses the term chukat about it, implying it is an enactment before me, right, from God, and you have no right to criticize it. So it's, I think it's saying like this word chukat is very forceful because, yeah, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense and perhaps... Um, folks would raise questions and raise critiques about it. And so, um, you know, Rashi is saying chukat because it's a, uh, it carries a lot of weight to it. Um, and, um, um, right. And here again, we see this, this question about what does it mean that it's a, um, a perfect, how, Adam, uh, you know, Aduma Timima, pure red. Um, this means that it should be perfect in respect to its redness, so that if there are two black hairs in it, or two of any color other than red, it is unfitted for, for the right um, described here. Um, so we're going to see about, let's see what else Rashi, other things Rashi may um, tell us about. Um, right, and I think another thing that's interesting, um, and I think we looked at this earlier on um, when we were in the book of Leviticus about what it meant to be outside the camp. El um, michutz And so there's an understanding that this means it's like outside of the three camps, that the, the camp geographically was divided up, right? There was the space around the mikdash around the holy space and then the dwelling spaces around that and then beyond that another border so um they're saying like it's going the farthest reach outside of the camp 
Um, and right, and then the other thing that's kind of curious is that um, Elazar takes it out. Elazar takes it out, um, and then the language tells us uh, one shall slaughter it. Um, Veshachat ota um, lefanav. So it's like there is this non-priest. Somebody else slaughters it. So that's another question. Why? Why do you think Elazar, the the priest, wouldn't um, actually do the shchita, do the the slaughtering of the para? Well. So that he can remain ritually pure. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So he, yeah, so he maybe can remain pure. And then I guess right, but then there's this like other strange thing about the animal, you know. Right. In order to purify from coming in contact with death, like it takes the death of this animal, right? Which is also complicated. Um Um, I was just going to find another Rashi. Hang on one second. I wanted to show you. Um, I wanted to find, sorry, I'm looking for one, one commentary. Um, Okay, I'm not finding what I was uh, looking for here, but um, um, but yeah, I, did, I um, let me stop the screen share for a second. Yeah, I wanted us just to, you know, get a sense of the Rashi and the rabbis, and I think the big takeaway that they have from this parsha is again that the paraduma was extremely rare and hard to find. That this law seems enigmatic, um, but then ultimately becomes um has a lot of weight behind it as something that is beyond our understanding, but sort of essential to maintaining the bonds um, with the, the system of, of holiness. And what's the whole point of the system of, um, you know, the temple cults and the holiness is to right, create a space uh, for God to kind of dwell among the people. And, you know, for, according to the system, something about coming in contact with death and what it could do um, kind of interrupts this like space of the um, Kodesh HaKodeshim that the Holy of Holies and um, that the that the priests are trying to build. But I think something else that's like fascinating is that space is imbued with, with danger, right? Even, you know, um, we see the priests, it's a very dangerous business to kind of enter into the Holy of Holies and um, there are risks and even, you know, like we have Aaron's sons who offer up some kind of strange offering and they're kind of um, killed in the process. So it's like, on the one hand, this idea of kind of keeping the space out of contact with those who've been in contact with death, right? And then on the other hand, the space itself is incredibly fraught and um, there's so much power to it that it's God's space and um, and there has to be so much kind of care and caution um, exercised in in the way the rituals are designed and the offerings are made and um, 
which is another sort of interesting paradox of the of the system. Um, Beth, you have something? Yeah. Uh, no, it's I because I've kind of attended some sessions on like have recognition societies. And yeah, it fascinates me because when people do that arm's length thing, it's such a natural part of life. And how can a spiritual system build a healthy relationship with death and dying and transition and loss if you're kind of like yuck over there? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I don't have an answer here. I just have, uh, you know, oh, we, we and in one of the sessions, they mentioned that the times of the most like growth or advancement in the whole you know, mortuary fields was like the Civil War. And mm. Anyway, it was just fascinating how um, uh, I'm, I, unfortunately, you know, we're kind of going through a period now, but uh, <laughs> of, of contemplating, you know, um, yeah, I, I guess that's the part that I just really um, wrestle with in like in a time when, you know, the family or loved ones or support system need everyone close, but there's still this notion of like this very sharp divide of life and death and maintaining that in like um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, and what it means to provide you know, sensitive care, just the, la the language seems hard. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. The language anyway. in, the, in the Torah here. <laughs> yeah, or what it means. Yeah. What, um, right, how to provide a sense of um, care. I'll make more sense in a second because I get to get off the bus. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining. Well, I'm like, oh, yeah. um, that's great. Torah and um, the go. I love. Um, so, I mean, one of the other things I want to, um, which I think is fascinating, right, is like where this falls in the narrative. So, Parshat Chukat opens with this ritual of the Para Aduma. And then later on in the Parsha, um, you know, we read about the deaths of Miriam and Aaron. So, I think it's also. Um, you know, that the people are feeling a huge uh, personal loss um, of leadership. And, you know, Miriam dies and the community is, has no water. And so they call out against Moses and Aaron and, um, you know, um, and saying like, and, and are afraid they're not gonna make it through the wilderness. And they're also saying, you know, it's Moshe, well, well, I wish we had kind of gone down with Korah's gang that got swallowed up, you know, by the earth last week. Like, what are we even doing here? And, oh my gosh, are we going to make it any further, right? So there, there's so much anxiety around their own survival. Um, and, um, you know, Moshe, this, and also in this Parsha, right, Moshe is like, oh, these people need water. What am I going to do, right? Moshe strikes the rock and then he is punished, um, for that and you know god decrees he's not allowed to get into um the promised land and um god had already told him that when the spies came back two parasha to go when yehoshua and Kalev ben yafuna both said it's a great land we can all go and the rest of the 10 tribes the 10 spies said no we can't mm -hmm. moshe and aaron had no way to deal with the report of the 10 tribes. They did not show any leadership by mm -hmm. Yipol Altenehem. They fell on their faces. And it was at that point that God let them know only Kovet, Kalev, and Yehoshua from this generation are going to be going into Canaan. So the, Moshe already knew he wasn't going in. And my feeling is, I mean, I've got a whole different take on hitting the rock. Yeah, what do you think? I think... First of all, it doesn't say they're being punished for hitting the rock. It says they're being punished because they did not exalt God in front of the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to me, what that means is when the, two, when, the tri when the spies came back in the early parasha, they didn't act as leaders. And that's when Yehoshua begins or continues to ascend as the leader. And here again, when the people are complaining, they fall on their face. They don't have a way to lead the people and follow God. And that's what I think is meant by you didn't exalt me in front of them. Because it says at the beginning of this, before hitting the rock, it says, take your staff. 
Now think about that staff. That staff turned into snakes. That staff brought blood and half the tribes when he was told to lift up that staff. That staff split the waters of, Red, of the Red Sea. There's never been a time when God says, kach et hamate, and then you're not supposed to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. So my whole feeling is, is that really this whole thing is finally Moshe during the whole time has been saying, oh, these people, I can't deal with these people. I can't lead these people. It's too much for me. Kill me, Moshe says at one time, if you want me to lead these people. And I think here what's happening is God recognizes that it's really true. Moshe is finished with his leadership. And this act of saying to him, you're not going into Canaan because if Yehoshua is going to be leading the people, we don't want to have two leaders at this critical time where you're going to be going in and beginning to fight wars. I think this is Rachmanut by God saying to him, you know what? It's enough for you. You've led the people up to this point. I heard you saying you can't lead them anymore. You're finished. We'll go into Dvarim, into par in Sefer Dvarim. You'll give a couple of speeches. You'll wrap it all up. But you're not going to go in. Yehoshua is going to take the people in. And it's a relief for you. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty weird take on this story. But I don't think, since he already knew when the spies came back that he wasn't going into Canaan, I don't think we can say that he's punished at this point by not being able to go into Canaan. He was already, that was already decided. Anyhow. <laughs> Interesting. No, thank you for sharing. Well, the, the, the reason I can say that is because four years ago, during this summer period, Rabbi Abe asked me to do a Dvar Torah on Chukat. Ah, very nice. Okay, so you can. So that's where it comes from. Beautiful. <laughs> that's yeah. No, thank you for sharing that um, perspective. And I see, hi, Phyllis. <laughs> Glad you're here as well. Um, yeah. So I know we're we're gonna um, wrap up in a, in a few minutes today, but I, I guess I, I think one of the themes, you know, that Shlomo mentioned that again in this, in this parasha um, that really strike me, um, pun intended, <laughs> with the, um, are, you know, the limits of control uh, of what the people are able to control um, and not, and what's sort of beyond the limits of understanding and beyond our ability to um, control in the world. And to me, like the, this, this ritual of the para duma, um, of this prescription of what, what to do when we come in, in contact with um, death, which ultimately becomes an almost a, a very, the, the process itself and the possibility of finding the red heifer, you know, um, in the state that it's meant to be in, like the, is really, I think pointing us in this direction of like, we're all, again, as, as, as human beings who are mortal, who have a limited time frame on this earth, um, you know, there, there is no way to not be touched by, by death in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And I think we're living in a, in a period where we're, some of us more um, closely than others, but just um, really seeing that and, and, and feeling that risk. So then the question is, well, so then how, do we reconnect um, in, in those moments, you know, when we've um, either been cut off by grief or by, by fear of loss or anticipatory grief? What does it take to then sort of be brought back into, into the community, right? And, and so I think there's something beautiful and inspiring in a way, the one who kind of goes to purify then also becomes impure and I think like to me that that figure in the Parsha that willingness to sort of um, uh, get get close um, spiritually and be part of that process right so like a person can't re-enter alone um, a person needs the help of others in the community um, who are willing to be vulnerable in a way to to sharing the the pain or the experience and um, so I think to me there there's something powerful about that? Like, what does it look like in spiritual community um, to be able to um, 
offer that, you know, for, to one another to be able to open up to hear somebody else's um, pain or story um, to become vulnerable to sort of letting that in in order to help another person um, come back in um, to the community. And again, our, our, the state that we're in also worried about physical safety mm -hmm. and well-being, um, you know, makes it challenging in some ways for, as things are happening digitally. And I still do believe we, we have that um, power, especially in times like these when we, we really need our spiritual community and we need one another to kind of help us navigate these times and, and um, be able to, to be open to each other's experiences and helping people find a pathway um, back. So, um, so just wanted to share a little bit of those kind of closing thoughts of where I uh, found some inspiration in this enigmatic Parsha um, in the sense that um, of the that humans need each other, right? There's no such thing as being totally outside the camp. There is always the person who's going to kind of go outside of the camp to help bring somebody somebody back in. There's always a way back in. Um, and when we read this uh, when we read this poor portion, the the para and Shabbat para before Passover, uh, we read a passage, the Haftarah comes from Ezekiel, and um, there's a beautiful quote from the prophet Ezekiel, he says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean, I will cleanse you from all your, right, all your tumah, um, and, and I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit into you. Um, so I sort of like that connection between these processes of like, uh, going from a state of tumah to a state of tahara as finding um, a new heart and a new spirit, right? That sort of comes from beyond um, in order to reconnect to life after surviving something, you know, like this. So um, it's my wish for, for all of us as a community in these times that we can help each other um, in these frightening moments and times of loss to help find ways of renewing our hearts and renewing our spirits um, and, and feeling that sense of connection. Um, so, um, yeah, so I just wonder if anyone has other closing remarks or responses, we're going to wrap up in just a few minutes. And um, I want to thank you all for being on this Torah study journey. Some of us, you know, uh, we started the, the Lunch and Learn class. Um, we had one in person in the law firm, and that was right about the time when we did close down and, and move into our... Um, uh, virtual uh, Beit Midrash here. So um, it's been a real gift to get to study Torah with all of you um, over these past few months. I've really, really appreciated hearing your your insights and um, going through, you know, being in conversation with some of our commentators from the generations over this time period. And I really appreciated that. And even though we're going to go on hiatus from the lunch and learn um, in the summer, I really hope we'll be able to come back come back together and continue our, our online Torah study, um, you know, in, in the next year and in Elul and, and moving forward. Um, so. Can I ask you a question about Yeah, Rashi? yeah, sure. In the first comment that we looked at, Rashi brought Satan into, the, into his <laughs> comment. And I want to ask about that. I mean, what was Rashi's thinking about Satan? I mean, was it that he actually believed there was a Satan or... He's just using that as to make a point in his drash. Um, I don't know that he believed, like, you know, Satan does figure in, right, to some of the understandings and some of the liturgy. I can't remember exactly where it, for, uh, but there is, I mean, he, the Satan is a figure. I mean, sometimes maybe it kind of comes up as like the Yetzer Hara or the evil. Okay, Satan. I understand what you're saying. Um, I'm trying understand. to think, I'm just trying to remember where it first comes. If it's in the book of Job. Or, uh, but there is a sense of like Satan being like an, a figure among other celestial beings that we see in the Tanakh. I just can't oh, remember. In e definitely um, in Eov. In, yeah, in Eov. But I can't remember if there's somewhere else uh, before that. 
Um, but it is, there is like a kind of some, yeah, a, a figure with not good intentions that's like adversarial to the. Um, yeah, but I was asking you if we, if we know what Rashi's belief was. Oh, I don't know. That's I the question know. I was asking. You had so many good questions about Rashi. Right? I, mean, I want to find a good like book, you know, figure out how do we learn more about uh, Rashi's approach. Um, you've asked a lot of great questions about that. Too. So I want to look for recommendation if there's a good book about like getting inside Rashi's mind. I know we have all the super commentators, um, but if we really want to like understand Rashi better, I'm sure there are uh, like bio, you know, biography. Well, I'm going to see if I can find a good recommendation. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, do, if, uh, do others have any Closing thoughts? Um, <laughs> Jeff, yeah. <laughs> Measure twice, cut once. Also, enjoy your summer respite. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you. No, Quasi-hiatus, really enjoy. Oh, thank you. No, I mean, I'll still be around <laughs> to do another like, high holiday, getting ready for yeah. high holidays and other things, too. And, and so please, like, feel Definitely. free to reach out. If you have questions, if you want recommendations for study, you know, continuing study, mm -hmm. Over the summer, we'll be at, we'll be with you on Shabbat, you know, doing study as well. So we'll, there will be right Torah study. Um, but thank you. I, no, I really, really appreciate that. Um, Are we doing uh, Psalms tonight or Wednesday night? Wednesday. Psalms is Wednesday. The last Psalms okay. class. We're going to look at the twenty-third Psalm. So um, and it, that kind of it's like has its own theology in one in one Psalm. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. Um, so I just want to offer a blessing as we're we're closing out this lunch and learn for now, and we'll come back together. We've been doing you know in our weekly zoom shabbat a blessing before and after the torah reading um and um so i'm just gonna you know say recite the closing blessing that we've been we say um for for torah study um which is an irregular shabbat if we're reading or when we're reading from a torah scroll the opening blessing but i just want to want to recite that Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher bachar banu mikol haamim benat hamlanu et torato Baruch atadonai noten haTorah. Thank you, God, for, for using us and gifting us with your words of Torah to help us navigate this world. And may these words be sweet in our mouths, and may they sustain us and give us courage and give us wisdom and help us stay connected to you and to one another through these times and through all times. Thank you, Holy One, for the gift of Torah. And thank you, all of you, for the gift of studying together. Julia, oh, I see. I yeah. said thank you for this and have enjoy some private time over the summer. Right. Thank you. Thank you. With your family. <laughs> thank you. You're in a week, Have a nice two day break. Okay. Be well, everybody. Be and we'll see night. you soon. Maybe see you Wednesday, Wednesday uh, for Psalm 23. Okay. Right. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Phyllis. Bye, David. Bye, Elkin. Bye-bye.